With that, we are down to agenda item number eight, our post-wildfire flooding update. All right, good evening, Mayor, Council. Appreciate you taking the time today to once again uh, review some of our post-wildfire flooding updates. We're gonna hear some conversations about museum. We're gonna hear some conversations about Pipeline West, some of the projects that are going on in the area, and uh, go over some of the uh, progress that we've made this year. Uh, really tremendous progress, so. With that, we'll get it kicked off. And oh, I apologize, Sam Beckett, Section Director of Public Works. So again, the agenda here, uh, we'll review the monsoon season, some of the impacts that we saw this year. I know many of you were out there and saw those Im impacts firsthand, but we'll discuss those today. Some of the infrastructure projects, feasibility phase two, which specifically for museum, um, and then as well as Prop 441. Pipeline West area updates include uh, the 2022 monsoon season as well, infrastructure in those areas, and the uh, financial update at the very end to help put everything in perspective, as well as we'll touch quickly on the SBA loans and the communications that have gone out for those SBA loans. This here is just a reminder of what we were dealing with in some of our potential flood risks, how close these risks um, are to each other, yet impact completely different areas of the community. Uh, again, all tie back to you know our beautiful mountain ranges and people just uh, being negligent at the end of the day. So just always a reminder to uh, be safe and be cautious out there. And again, uh, towards the, the uh, right-hand side of your screen, you see the 2022 pipeline fire. Uh, and towards the middle there in that uh, orangish uh, fall color, if you will, the uh, 2019 museum fire burn scar and the impacted regions for perspective. For museum flood area in particular, this is some of the data that we pulled from this year to help us understand what did we see? What were the impacts? Uh, we were fortunate this year that we didn't see significant flooding in the museum uh, and the uh, Schultz Creek Wash. With that said, uh, we didn't see the numbers like we saw previously. And you'll see that in these charts here as far as our maximum totals and our intensity um, readings in those areas the numbers were a little off compared to what we saw last year. And we didn't see those long, intense uh, storms like we saw. However, we saw storms that we kind of hoped we would see. Those storms that come in, soak up, and allow for vegetation to build, and hopefully we have a good foundation moving forward. Uh, but again, we just didn't see the impacts like we saw, those same rainstorms over that exact region. And so it's just important to note that here, uh, mitigation measures were put in place. There was a ton of good work put in up there that did help uh, mitigate a ton of the watershed. However, there are several areas that aren't there yet. We will talk about one of the projects. Uh, we'll hit on it really quick. It's a county project that they, uh, I believe, have kicked off, and we'll discuss that here in just a minute. So rainfall intensities uh, for the... This is for um, the date range here of June 29th for Pipeline East versus Museum South. And you can see um, those rainfall intensities, while um, impactful, we just didn't see what we, we thought we would see. And that is something we deal with um, more often than not. We saw that for two years preceding the fire in the museum area. As we roll into winter, uh, we understand that the short-term mitigations can be a burden for many. Um, understanding that they are there to protect their homes. There are certain pieces that um, we hope that residents keep in place until we do have better data and we have seen this tried and tested in these watersheds. So we do ask that residents leave their short-term mitigations in place, yet understanding some of the bigger mitigations like concrete barrier, um, really do make it difficult for residents to move on their on their own. So those are items that we have worked with some of the residents, specifically in the museum area, 
to help remove some of those concrete barriers so they could have better access through the winter time and with them understanding that it does leave them at a potential risk uh, without those being in place, but understanding um, that at some point you do have to, uh, we have to figure out how do we move forward um, and get people to a better state of normalcy. And again, as winter preparations come around, our ask are, if you are looking to get rid of your sandbags, and uh, again, it's not something that we are recommending by any means, but for those who choose to, please contact us via our uh, call center line, which is 928-213-2102, and we will provide pallets. In doing so, it helps us reuse and not waste as many sandbags. So if there's any that can be reused, we're more than happy to stockpile them, we are covering them up, and store them through the winter time in case we need them to be reused for the following year. Uh, understanding many of the bags have degraded and they won't survive that, that second move, but uh, we are trying to give that option out there for anybody looking for it. The On Forest Alluvial Fan, uh, this one here is the West Tributary, uh, the picture that you see here. This one here was completed and uh, has as you can see, kind of been tested in some sense. We did see some rains in the area, and you can see some of the flows that came through there. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. It spread out the water flow. It reduced impacts to the area, so we're pretty excited about that. We don't have a picture of it yet, but the new uh, north fans, which will be uh, a huge piece of the mitigation and a majority of the water, um, that project should be completed by November, and that is a county project. They've done a bunch of phenomenal work on that. I don't know if the county flood control administrator is on board uh, with us virtually tonight. If so, uh, maybe she could speak to this. And understanding they also had a board meeting tonight, so they may not be on board. But um, this is something that we hope to be able to bring back at our joint work session coming up. Uh, with, the, with the county city, and hopefully they can hit on this and give us some uh, better progress updates, but just wanted to let everybody know there's still work going on in the museum to help mitigate those impacts. Parkway basins. This is one of the other very important projects that we're working on to uh, try and help alleviate any impacts if we see them. Now that potential is still there. Uh, even with the new fan up top, uh, there's still a very high potential to see water that we've never seen before, which is why we've done all the mitigation work we've done to date. This will be another important project to help uh, reduce water flows, reduce sediment, and uh, hopefully allow the stormwater system that's there to better absorb the impacts as it comes in, understanding that uh, the amount of water coming out of the forest, once we see an event uh, at the same magnitude like we saw last year, will most likely, well, will almost indefinitely overrun the system that we currently have in place. Um, but again, hopefully uh, less significant impacts moving forward is the goal. The parkway basins have actually made a lot of progress. Our hope is to have all of the utilities, ro uh, utilities relocated. Um, scheduled for this fall. Tree removal will occur, uh, will occur this fall as well and construction in the spring to start on these projects. Again, these will be very, very impactful. They will be the last um, ditch effort, if you will, to reduce sediment before we get into the city stormwater uh, infrastructure, that first Linda Vista crossing. So these basins will be just above that. This should help get rid of any of that last bit of uh, sediment and debris and attenuate some of that water or reduce some of the water um, velocities, if you will. This one here is uh, the feasibility phase two study. So understanding that we have done a ton of great work on forest above the communities here in uh, the city, there is still a ton of potential to come out of these watersheds. While we hope to see a bunch of regrowth and understand uh, that we didn't see the flooding this year, we didn't see that sediment move, we still have channels in places we didn't have channels before. We're seeing water flows in areas that we never saw before, and we understand those impacts are gonna continue. 
So as we work through projects like the Parkway Basins, uh, there are several other items listed on here like the uh, Grandview Improvements, the West Cedar Basin Development, the Linda Vista and Cedar Avenue Crossings, um, Channel Improvements, and the Royal Seiko Modifications. Now all of the work we did understanding that it will still wind up down at Killip. We just have to figure out how to safely get that water moved through the community and reduce those impacts to the residents. That's what feasibility uh, study phase two does. And that is uh, really key for us moving forward to understand how do we get all of that water out of the community yet through the community. It's a tough one to figure out, uh, and, but we've made a, a lot of really good progress here and we hope to continue down that avenue um, moving forward. Part of the study has been going back and modeling all of the current projects. So they've added all of the projects such as Killip Detention Basins, the West Tributary. They're looking at adding the new North uh, fans into that as well as the uh, alluvial fans above Paradise to help us understand what those impacts will be and where do we need to mitigate and then prioritize those projects uh, based on obviously life safety and the highest threat to uh, residents within the area. There has been significant cost benefit analysis uh, walked through in these processes from engineering to uh, every possible aspect we could look at uh, for impacts in the region. As we get closer on these projects, uh, we will be working to make sure we educate the public on what these are, how they impact the community, how they benefit the communities, and uh, what our end goal is uh, with the completion of these projects. Part of that you've probably seen is uh, tied to Prop 441. These projects uh, will fund a series of projects to increase the stormwater capa capacity in the Spruce Wash, including channel improvements from Paradise, to kill up detention basins, the projects we just discussed, continue improvements towards Route 66. These costs are not a small cost. And frankly, this number here is, uh, is a significant number, but at the end of the day, it is what we need to get to that end goal. Um, again, we wouldn't have put in all this work if we didn't believe the threat was still there and understanding that there is still a bunch of work to get done. And uh, so these are some of the items that we're looking to, to uh, get completed here shortly. With that said, uh, on Halloween, we're gonna be holding a Spruce Wash Project Delivery Summit. And part of that is going to be uh, understanding if we find the funds and we're able to get funded for these projects, how do we deliver them all in a very short period of time? As you all probably hear and you saw from our, our uh, engineering team here today, there are massive projects happening around the city all of which are just as important and need to be done in a timely fashion, yet our resources in this region are limited. So having this summit is key to better prioritize and strategically plan out our attack on some of these projects beyond uh, just our feasibility studies here and some of the other projects that are going on within the Pipeline West area. The goal here is to not reduce service for one project to complete another, but how do we get it all done in that short time frame? So really excited and uh, the support from City Manager Clifton here to help drive these uh, summits to make sure that we're all on the same page and that we're all working together. That will jump over to Pipeline. Pipeline is unfortunately where we saw the bulk of our impacts this year. I know many of you walked the streets and were out there with the residents uh, in the mud, in the water, trying to figure out how do we, how do we get ahead of it. This was uh, kind of unprecedented to see. Uh, and the work that's been done afterwards, uh, which is even more impressive. So again, here's some of the storm impacts. We can see the numbers are significantly higher. Uh, for Pipeline West, while the two watersheds are geographically very close. The storms are so unpredictable anymore, it's, uh, it's tough to understand where those are going to impact and uh, how they're going to impact in those durations. So here's just a couple of those storms that we saw impacts from and what those rain totals were. Um, unfortunately, while this one isn't highlighted, this is a, a impressive one to note. This is one of the ones we saw on the east side. Again, 
within a mile range, uh, we could have seen significantly different impacts than we saw uh, with those kind of uh, numbers right there. With this one here, I'm going to hand it over to our uh, emergency management director and contracts director, uh, Stacy Breckman. -Hanks. Thanks. That was a nice introduction. Um, so, Stacy BK, Stacy Breckman Eggs, Grants Contracts Emergency Management Director. So, Inner Basin Pipeline. Um, a lot of you know about this pipeline. I'm going to give you a quick super history. Um, obviously, the pipeline that was damaged in the Schultz Fire in 2010 in 28 locations. Um, it took two years to repair that. We had a federal FEMA declaration and emergency um, uh, state declaration with Arizona Department of Mer uh, Military Affairs funding. Um, it took us five years to close that disaster recovery event. It's um, a very long-term process when we get into these um, recovery efforts. Um, we created an historical booklet. Aaron Young spent some time and created a really nice booklet. If you don't have a copy of that, please email me. I'd love to give it to you. It's got a lot of history about Flagstaff and them taking the pipe and the mules up the um, inner basin in, and um, doing the, the different uh, levels of clay pipe to, um, to concrete to ductile iron. Um, so, um, a great, great book. That project actually won a state award and a national award. I actually flew to Toronto with the contractor and um, for a day flew to uh, Canada. It was a quick trip, <laughs> um, but, um, but won a national award. So, um, a lot of history up there on the basin. Um, I actually co-managed it with our water services project manager. Um, the spring um, water can peak up um, as high as 2 million gallons per day. Um, the uh, design capacity of the North Reservoir filtration um, plan is um, the inner basin water is treated um, is 4 million gallons a day. And overall, um, the inner basin water can account for uh, at least 20% daily potable water demand during the peak summer months. And why I'm saying that is because the pipeline is damaged, we are not receiving any water. Um, so we're losing quite a bit of, of um, capacity and water that we need. Um, right now, the inner basin water line damaged in new locations above Lockett Meadow and Schultz Creek. So if you can look at that map, um, the 28 locations that started just after Windy Point, I don't have a pointer, but um, I think here is where we had the 28 locations and then go down. But what's happened is we have seen new damage up above here. And um, during the Pipeline West, um, this was one of what we call our values at risk, um, was the inner basin. They sent a team up there. We worked very hard to save our inner basin, but um, we saw a lot of damage up above um, where the original 28 locations were fixed. We um, saw we had put in timber walls um, to say, because we had so much down trees back in 2010 when we were up there, we ended up using some of the down logs to create timber walls. They actually burned um, during this last pipeline west fire. Um, so the timber walls are gone. We had a lot of road damage. A lot of the, um, um, the uh, gabion walls and where we encapsulated the pipe and put concrete over it um, actually was okay, it saved. Um, we had some drone footage that was done by David and Jeremy and Capitol and we were able to look at a lot of that drone footage and see where um, some of it was saved, um, some of the roads were um, washed out and, and the timber walls. Uh, what the next plan is, we met with our, we had um, uh, uh, Jacobs Engineering come up and they spent a day with us um, for free. He just came up, he was the record of engineer um, in 2010, came up and we looked at all the footage and now what we need to do is a trip record. We need to get up there and get a little better estimate. Um, we have not um, scheduled that trip yet because we need to make sure that our team is safe and can get up there when there's not falling rocks and trees. And um, we'll go up with the Forest Service and our wild um, land fire team and um, our uh, capital engineers and get up there and see if we can uh, get a little better idea of the, of the um, damage. Um, we went ahead and um, met with DEMA, and they were able to look at some of the footage. They agreed this is an emergency. 
uh, we went through their emergency procurement process internally with city staff um, and with a purchasing uh, director and were approved for emergency procurement for the project. So we can um, technically go back to the same um, record of engineer with Jacobs and the contractor if we choose to do that. Um, but um, what is a good thing is we can move pretty fast, hopefully here as soon as the weather kind of um, changes. And I didn't expect rain today, did anybody? <laughs> it poured at City Hall and I looked out my window, it was hailing. So, um, so that's part of the reason we haven't really got up there and got a clear estimate because we really want our staff to be safe and not get up in a, in a high dangerous situation. Um, so a little bit about um, the 20-acre um, um, sediment and detention basins. Things are going great up there. I've been out there every week. Um, uh, I know Adam's on the line if we have any um, specific questions, but the uh, project is going um, really well. We continue to work with um, NRCS, which is National Natural uh, Resource Conservation Services Emergency Watershed Protection Project. They're out there looking at the projects and, um, and very pleased with it. We're also working to see if we can get the downstream uh, channel stabilization funded um, with NRCS. And that application is, or the damage survey report is sitting with them, just waiting to see if we can get in the queue for some funding. So um, working on that. The Bulks Covert, um, we have a couple concept plans that will be presented by SWI today. Um, for improvements um, within um, ADOT right away and outside of ADOT right away. We're working with ADOT um, heavily on the protect formula funds uh, that are potential. They're um, with ADOT. I've had some uh, number of conver conversations. They're just trying to figure out the package. They have the formula funds and how they're going to be able to disperse that. So it'll either be through that protect formula fund or another funding source. And then this is a little bit about, um, shows a photo of the um, basins. Uh, of course, you all know about the 20-acre city-owned parcel that we took. Um, we're incorporating uh, trail access, trailhead parking, historic interpretation, and landscaping. We're um, looking, I'm working with a potential budget adjustment or a scope um, change with NRCS to see if we can get a fence in there, a access control fence, and some gates to see if we can get that approved just to um, kind of corner off that area and so that we have um, protection for any vehicles trying to get in there. Uh, we're on track to complete um, uh, approximately the end of the month on the 26th and um, continuing stabilization, the concrete head walls and overflow uh, weir structures. It's looking amazing out there. If you haven't gone out there, please do so. I'm happy to do any tours. I know Adam's out there every day, so if anybody wants a, a site visit, um, I'm happy to have you join me. And with that, I will turn it over to Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. And I think it's important to note um, that is a massive project. I don't know if you saw that picture right there. That is not a small piece of land. And the fact that that was completed in the time window it's been completed by, the team that's been working on that, Adam, who's been out there every single day, uh, just a ton of good work to get this in place, um, kind of a one in a million project. The fact that we had this uh, option and that all of the stars aligned and that everybody was able to communicate with each other and to get this project delivered in the time frame they did. I don't know if we'll ever see that again in, in that time frame, but good work. Uh, now, water's still going to come out of those basins. That's a lot of water. Uh, 56 acre feet of water, I believe, or 56, yeah, right? 56 acre feet of water. Am I saying that right? So I'm confirming with my crew here. A uh, lot of water. It's still going to make its way down to Highway 180. Now, that's where it gets tricky. We got the easy part done, in a sense, which is a massive project. That should never be an easy uh, project, but that was the easy part. Now we've got some hurdles. Uh, we've got multiple jurisdictions we got to work through. We've got some private property we got to work through, a ton of utilities, and some funding issues. So this is where um, these project conversations have led us down to, is getting all that water that's going to build up there in those basins, and how do we safely get it across 180 and out of the community? So a ton of design ideas have come out of this. We've narrowed it down to two ideas. I'll let uh, Stephen Irwin from SWI speak to those here in just a minute as he has been just 
key in trying to get these designs completed and functional and uh, figure out how do we work with all the, the different jurisdictions to get it completed. Uh, both concepts uh, allow for 950 CFS, which would uh, fully contain the flow from the output of what the basins will do and, uh, from a 100-year storm event. With that, it gets a little technical, and that's where you don't want to hear me speak, so I'm going to let Stephen talk to that and uh, talk about where we are and uh, the two viable options. Thank you, Sam, Mayor, Council. My name is Stephen Irwin. I'm with SWI Engineering. Um, as Sam mentioned, we've worked the last several months with city staff, ADOT, county staff, um, fire, uh, fire department, trying to figure out the best option to get water from Highway 180 to the Rio de Flag. Um, this first option you see on the screen here, um, the box culvert currently follows the same general alignment and then it turns to the south and then this is undersized based on the post wildfire uh, flow rates. So what we're trying to do here instead of taking this to the south and then through uh, the existing storm drain, we looked at, uh, narrowed it down to these two options. This first option you'll see is a double barrel. It's two eight foot by five foot box culverts. Um, goes across 180, clips the Grand Canyon Trust uh, driveway, parking lot, and then it gets onto this fire department, uh, City Flagstaff property. From here, you can see the box uh, ends and stormwater will discharge into an open channel. Goes open channel through this Atwood Family Trust parcel. See it turns here, we have another set of box culverts because this is uh, multiple uh, residents and property owners use this as access. So we need to get that water under their access back into the Rio de Flag. Um, here's the Rio de Flag runs uh, more or less north-south in this area. Our second option, um, back to, I'll, I'll show you the first option on this slide. Uh, this is the existing uh, inlet to the existing box culvert that runs diagonal across Highway 180. What we looked at on this one was more of a straight shot route to the Rio de Flag. It will require some regrading on this uh, Museum of Northern Arizona parcel. But as you can see, it's a straight shot from Schultz Creek all the way over to the Rio de Flag. Um, some uh, Positives out of this, from what we can tell, we haven't done an in-depth utility investigation yet. There should be less utility conflicts. Um, and this is a main highway in our area for local and, and uh, people passing through town. So if we can get this straight shot as opposed to a diagonal crossing, impacts and closures to Highway 180 are minimized. Um, from 180, um, as opposed to the, the option one, this will stay underground, two eight by five box culverts through the church uh, school parking lot, through their uh, field here. Uh, it, we looked at an open channel option, but with this being a school and a church, uh, we felt that, that that probably wasn't a safe design. So keeping that underground so all of this can still be utilized. Um, and then it discharges back into the Rio de Flag. Um, another thing I'd like to point out about these two options with option two, this is all within city limits. So um, property acquisitions becomes a little bit more straightforward um, as opposed to crossing this direction and then this is a county island. So you have city, county, ADOT, We've worked together great so far, but I think that that property acquisition would get a little more difficult. Um, we do questions now or at the end? One more. Okay, so we put together this decision matrix. This was more from us looking at it as engineers, trying to break it down into costs, management complexity, so how many property owners you know, one of them has more property owners than the other. We've got this color-coded 
Legend down here, similar to a traffic signal, green, yellow, red. Next, we have constructability. I kind of touched on this. Option one is a diagonal crossing, more impacts to Highway 180, traffic impacts, um, could potentially be a longer duration of construction. Um, option two is in city limits, there's only two property owners that we would have to work with on property acquisitions as opposed to four. You see it is slightly less square feet of property on option one, but more property owners um, to negotiate with. All right, thanks Stephen. So, again, so I have, yeah. sorry, I have a quick sorry. question on that. Um, so what I'm gathering, especially with the property acquisition um, from multiple owners, uh, the one part on the rubric that uh, I'm wondering about is time. So would the option to be feasibly more likely to occur more quickly than option one? Sure. So at this point, working with the different property owners, most likely. Uh, option one, which would uh, would make a lot of sense, uh, it would follow the current path. It does add some complexity in there that, uh, with one of the one of the property owners in particular, uh, that it's going to be a tough hurdle. It's going to be a tough hurdle, and because that property owner isn't within city limits, uh, it makes it even more challenging. Uh, we kind of have to work third party to figure out how do we make. Um, all of that aligned. So that one there is, is uh, while probably the, the more um, reasonable option, it's probably not going to be the most efficient option moving forward. So as they went through, they started with 10 different designs. What are, what are all of the potential concepts that could come together? These came down to the, the two most viable options. Um, and again, they each come with their own complexity. This is something we're still working through here, uh, but yeah, option one is uh, does add some some higher complexities with one of the property owners in particular. Excellent, thank you. And I'll just note that with option two, it may have a little bit higher price tag, but doing it sooner uh, helps not just to protect residents sooner, but with the inflationary costs for construction. Uh, would potentially even be cheaper if it goes a full year, uh, additionally a full construction season to get completed. So as we look at these numbers, I just want to point that out. Councilmember Schmoney. Thank you, Mayor. S Stephen, thank you for your presentation and your work on this with the team. Um, so it sounds like option one would have been the ideal option if it wasn't for the complexities. Is that correct? Yeah, this was... Uh... As Sam said, we, we had multiple different iterations and then um, with each concept, those also had iterations. So just to give you an idea, we looked at, you can see this channel here. We tried to keep it on one property. We looked at what, is there a way to lessen the burden and straddle the property line? Um, so we looked at a lot of those. At, at first, this was the preferred option. Um, until we started looking uh, more of the details of not just the bottom line, what is the cost? Um, county versus city limits, uh, closures to 180, that's huge, um, uh, reducing those closures. So, yeah, I would say option one was um, preferred at one point. And can you just orient me with option two? Is that not 180 as well? Yes. Yes, so option one comes off through this side here. And then option two, we would do some uh, channel grading to kind of reroute that channel and get a more straight shot through the, the Lutheran Church parcel. Okay, you know, I'll take the team's word and the engineer's word in terms of what's the best approach and what option makes most sense, but if there is complexities that you know mayor and, and council members can help out with if, in terms of meeting with landowners, I'm not, I'm not too sure what would be supportive here, but uh, if there's anything we can do, if option one were the, the better option, um, you know, let us know if there's something we can do to help. But if you all decide option two is the best approach, I, I fully support whichever one we choose. Thank you. 
Um, one, one other thing that um, was just pointed out with option two, we have the ability to, um, I don't want to get too technical here, but we can pull this outlet of the box culvert a little bit further th from the wash, which kind of lets that water to spread out, slow down. As we're all seeing from the flooding in this area, getting water to turn 90 degrees isn't ideal. So if we can get that water slowed down and allow it to turn, you'll see on the other side of the wash, we have this other, we're calling it a wall right now. We'll see in final design, but that's to armor that slope from you know, getting hit with those floodwaters. And that leads me to my last question that I forgot a second ago, but what is the impact to the Rio de Flag and downstream? Can you just walk us through what that might look like, channeling this much water down it? Sure, so um, that kind of goes back to, um, it is one overall watershed, but you have different tributaries. So the likelihood, um, the likelihood that this tributary um, contributing to Schultz Creek flooding, flash flooding at the same time as the main Rio to Flag Channel, um, it, it's pretty low. It, it's possible, I, I, I have to say that, emphasize that it is possible. Um, but in the models that J.E. Fuller is working on, I don't know if Joe's on, um, but when it's just Schultz Creek flooding, um, this is able to stay within the channel, the Rio to Flag Channel. So any other questions on this bit before we continue? Councilmember Sells. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A couple of questions. First of all, thank you for, for the very um, <clears throat> informative uh, presentation. Um, for option two, it says option provides no adverse impact to downstream properties. And that's kind of spelled out in the matrix with the color coded. Um, and it did not say so on option one. So does it mean that option one will likely have adverse impact to downstream properties? So what that means with adverse impacts in any um, stormwater drainage design, that's what we're looking for. And that's kind of what's happening on the museum with that modeling of we're modeling all of these projects to make sure that there's no unintended consequences. So for example, we're putting all that water into the kill up detention basin. If that overflows, where does it go? And does it send more water somewhere where it's not supposed to go? So with this option two, um, what happens when, when this culvert gets overwhelmed? There's two things happening. It overtops on a Highway 180, and until it reaches a, a large enough storm event, most of it will stay on this east side of Highway 180 and continue south, and then it'll start overtopping 180. Second thing that's happening is as this infrastructure goes downstream, there's a, a a catch basin structure, we've been calling it a bubbler, that, that gets overwhelmed and it starts bubbling back to the surface. So that's what a lot of our problems we've been seeing. So with this option two, I, I would say both options on the, the adverse impact, um, it, it still will overtop onto 180 and on certain storm events will flow over 180. Um, what we can do with option two is we can choke down. And when I say choke down, we analyze what that downstream infrastructure can convey. And we choke down this existing box culvert to where no more than what that downstream infrastructure can handle. So that's what that means by no adverse impact. Thank you for that clarity. Follow up. Um, uh, in your presentation, you mentioned option two, um, of course, it has less uh, uh, impact on utility and impact to traffic and uh, Highway 180 closure um, of during construction. And it said, you mentioned um, completely underground on 180. 
that's option two. Is option one above ground? So option one is, is underground under 180 and then it goes, transitions to an open channel on this stretch here. So it'll, it'll be on the same box size box culvert to um, eight by fives under 180, except option one transitions to an open channel. Whereas option two, you can see it stays in a box culvert the whole way. It's a straight shot indeed. So I yep. understand option two will likely be more expensive, but less impact to, to private property and it's all within city limits. Option one would probably be cheaper, but has um, more impact with multiple uh, property owners. Um, and of course, it's the diagonal um, this, um, design. So um, in, in your interaction and meetings with ADOT um, engineers, do, 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 did they specify a specific preference, which option? They're supportive of both options. Um, they do like option two from impact uh, perspective. Another thing I'd like to point out on option one here is this area here between the fire station and Grand Canyon Trust. If you go walk around, you can see uh, there's a, a overhead electric pole here where it goes underground. And we're assuming this is what feeds multiple properties. So we're, we're not 100% sure what's in that area. So if we can stay out of that area, um, that'd be beneficial. That's not to say we won't encounter anything on option two. Has there any discussion about funding with ADOT? So we have done preliminary cost estimates for these two options and we've split it into costs within the ADOT right of way versus outside right of way. It's my understanding they're pursuing funding. Um, Sam might be able to speak to that. Yeah. So ADOT's looking at all options at this point. They had looked at some at their uh, emergency funding. However, because there was no damage to Highway 180, it wasn't eligible for their emergency funding like uh, we saw out on Highway 89. However, they're still looking at uh, all the viable options that they might have to help support this project. It was just tougher uh, because they didn't have that eligibility um, because there was no technical damage to the road. Uh, but again, they've been great partners so far. They've been at the table through the design process and uh, really trying to figure out how do we work together to, to get this uh, impact reduced. For them, this is one of their main arterials uh, heading north out of town, getting up towards the Grand Canyon. So any kind of closure that we have here, and then we had several this, this summer, uh, are extremely impactful for them, and it's important that uh, we get that water conveyed under the roadway. Thank you so much. May I just offer a comment, Mr. Mary? Just I'm here to to be the kind of, and I brought this up already to the State Transportation Board and um, ADA Director Halikowski. So I'll be making noise <laughs> in, in a nice way. Uh, to our, uh, to our partners with ADOT about prioritizing funding for this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we can proceed with the presentation. All right, thank you, Stephen, appreciate it. And again, uh, as we worked with the museum side of the house, we're working with the pipeline side of the house uh, with residents to help them gain access back into their properties through the winter time with that understanding that there's always a risk potential. We've seen it a couple times where we have what we call a rain on snow event that could create some issues. So everybody says, well, it's winter time. We don't get flooding in the winter time. Not necessarily. I think most of you uh, probably have seen those impacts. So we have been working with residents. Actually, uh, today they went out and removed 40 pallets of resident filled pallets of sandbags today off of uh, Stavano Way to, uh, to help those residents out. And we were able to reuse some of those sandbags and uh, help with next year's uh, preparation efforts. But again, anybody who's in need of support uh, or needs pallets so they can uh, remove their own sandbags, we encourage them to call our call line. Same thing with concrete barrier removal and then 
all of this really lines up for our winter preparations and understanding uh, what does that look like and how is uh, snow going to impact uh, some of these areas. With this one here, uh, one of the more important updates, I'll hand it over to Brandy, uh, who has been our finance section chief on our IMT this year and just been phenomenal. So I want to thank her for all of her work and uh, let her update. Thank you, Sam. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council, Brandy Suda, serving as your city's finance director. Um, so this next dive just provides a brief cost update um, related to Pipeline West. So. Um, since our last presentation, there has been no change to the preseason mitigation costs related to both museum and pipeline at $471,000. Um, the cost estimate related to flood response has been updated to $351,000 based on our latest projections now that the monsoon season is coming to an end. Um, also, there is no update or change related to the estimate for private um, damage at 95,500. Um, the water control facility cost estimate estimate has been updated to 15.2 million dollars, which includes the interbasin water line, the Rio Channel, um, Highway 180 culvert, as well as Francis Short Pond. Um, we anticipate FEMA funding for the interbasin, the Rio Channel, as well as Francis Short Pond and the city um, working with ADOT is working on identifying funding or finding funding for the Highway 180 culvert. Um, and then lastly, we have no change on the grant match or design costs related to the Schultz Creek Basin project and the re related um, Natural Resource Conservation Service Emergency Watershed Protection Grant. So with that, I'll turn it back over to um, Sarah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brandy, and good evening, Mayor and Council Sarah Langley, Public Affairs Director. I um, wanted to take a minute tonight to touch on the Small Business Administration loans that are available to residents and um, on our communications efforts as well. So the SBA loans, hopefully everyone is aware of these by now, um, but for those in the Pipeline West area specifically, there are low interest loans from the federal government available um, not only to businesses, as you might think, it being an SBA program, but it's also available to um, homeowners and to renters. Um, and so there is um, loan money available for um, if your home was damaged or if your personal property was damaged inside or outside of your home um, because of flooding during uh, July 23rd through August 28th of this year. Um, so we've been working closely with the SBA's public information officer, uh, Louise Porter, who was actually physically stationed in Flagstaff up until the end of last week um, to you know, meet with residents and help get the word out. Um, jointly with the SBA and with the Flood Control District, we've done a lot of social media as well as uh, news releases and e-newsletters. We also sent a physical flyer to everyone um, in the Pipeline West area. You can see that there um, on the screen in both English and Spanish. Um, so main message is November 18th is the deadline for residents to apply for a physical damage loan. Um, so if residents are listening and they're maybe interested in learning more, um, we encourage them to reach out to the SBA and that website link is on the slide. And then um, for our communications efforts, of course they continue outside of monsoon season. Um, we continue to send out our e-newsletters and respond to, to you know, inquiries from residents um, weekly. Just as a reminder for anyone in the museum flood area who may be listening, they can visit museumfloodprojects.com to sign up for our e-newsletter and learn more about all of the different mitigation projects going on in the area. And then for Pipeline West, just wanted to highlight, we do have a community meeting coming up October 24th. I think that's two Mondays from now, um, 6 p.m. right here in City Hall and that'll be a joint meeting with both city and flood control district staff, as well as um, the, the different engineering firms that are contracted. Um, that meeting will focus on the different long-term mitigation plans that we have. Um, and then, of course, just another reminder for residents in the Pipeline West area, they can go to flagstaff.az.gov slash Pipeline West for more information. So that's our last slide. Mayor, I'll turn it back to you for any questions. 
Thank you. We do have a public participant. Um, so I would like to call Steve Burt, and uh, then we can have any further discussion from council. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. Uh, I'm back. So, yay on the basins, nice job. Okay. Uh, yay on pallets. Uh, me and three of my neighbors have built six walls at our expense. We're not looking to get reimbursed. We're trying to protect ourselves. We'd appreciate it if we get more than one visit to pick up pallets a week as the street guy said and did do. Now we have over 20 pallets on the street and six neighbors looking to get rid of some sandbags. Uh, so we'd appreciate the help. Uh, obviously, we're running short on time before November 1st. Uh, thank you. Um, now, my wife and I uh, and another neighbor volunteered to let water go through our property this summer. It's not going to do it again. As I mentioned, we built a wall and my neighbor built a wall. Uh, but we're coming here, and I've come numerous times. I sent an email out to the council, got no response September 8th, and we're trying to protect the people behind us and the people down at Coconino. As Steve mentioned, the bubbler's a main issue, and that's your code violation, which I'm sorry, I was wrong. It's not 16 years. The senior county engineer corrected me. It's 30 years you've been in violation with the county at that bubbler. And now it came to rest that it causes a good deal of flooding, not all on Savannah Way this past summer, but those apartments. Nine out of 15 apartment people had their homes flooded. Only two of us on Savannah Way did. But when I'd here looking for reimbursement, we're looking here for you to solve and fix your violation. I contacted the city code violation on September 22nd. That's been buried. I'm hearing crickets, much like the communication with the council. This is your bubbler. This is your violation. You know, known about it for over 16 years. 16 years ago, we have got the paperwork of your, the meeting from the planning commission and they were gonna do something about it. And now you're crickets. I, I hope some leadership would show up. If not, I hope there's some change in leadership in this coming election. Thank you. You, Steve Brad, I'd, I'd like to respond. Um, you know, I wasn't here 16 years ago. Uh, nobody on council was. And sometimes it does take catastrophic events for us to recognize that problems exist. In this case, somebody burning toilet paper that led to a catastrophic fire that led to water going through that bubbler that nobody, could have, nobody was expecting before. But I'm hoping that through the presentation today, you see how much design, how much coordination is happening to try to correct the problem, to try to protect the neighborhoods, that we are figuring out every way possible to come up with over $5 million needed to protect this area and ensure that that water isn't coming out of the bubbler like it was before. And this does take a lot of work and a lot of work is being done and a lot of leadership, whether it be the engineers or those of us who are pushing for additional funding from the federal and state government to see this through. And again, wasn't here 16 years ago and we are cleaning up a mess from something we could never have expected, a, a fire that burned over 22,000 acres. I understand nobody expected that and we bought a house, my wife bought a house, in a flood zone, we understand that, okay? And nobody expected this sequence of events, but we did bring this up. Steve mentions it, his engineers, your city engineers, Ed Shank, we bring this up. 
he's not have this project to fix. It's not on anywhere on your projects to fix the bubbler, okay? You've got the money, you've got access to a drainage directly to the Rio behind three in my neighbor's house. You have the option. I've seen your financials. I'm a financial expert. You've had tons of money that you could spend. It will take less than a couple million dollars. I'm not an engineer. I'm not sure what it's gonna cost, but I know, I know how to read your financial statements. You've got the money to fund this, and you, it's not in, in any of your projects. You're here now, and you haven't answered me. You haven't answered my neighbors. You haven't answered the poor people in the apartments who don't have a voice. I'd like to state that the design one option that was presented tonight was what you had been suggesting, but that is going to take a lot of property acquisition. That doesn't touch the bubbler, does it, Steve? The, that is option just one does not north, touch the bubbler, the does it? easement that you're speaking to right now. That is part of the easement, but that's, that easement is not large enough to channel that much water. I understand, I understand. This is not about solving the flooding problem, and he has to go through, and I'm great, I'll flood option two. But I also know, and you know, that stormwater was put up on the stormwater people to do that in 25. This is, a, this is something that needs to be done regardless. This isn't solving the problem. I never presented it that. This is your code violation that is causing part of the flooding, not part of the whole solution, mind you. The basin, his long-term project, and just fix the bubbler. You're out of code violation. You can't go from large to small anywhere in this country for over 100 years. Thank you, Stephen. Council Member Schmoney. Hi, Stephen. Good afternoon. Thank you for being with us. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. Uh, I just wanted to mention, I did read your emails, and I, didn't, I did not respond because, I believe because of legal concerns, I think we've been, at, you know, it's, it's a sensitive line, and I just wanted to mention that I'm happy to set up a meeting with you, and if you stick around, I'll, I'll, we can talk and set up, I'll give you my contact information, and we can work through this. Uh, at a recent budget retreat, I did ask staff, I believe it was Gary Miller with our team, if this was being addressed, and I think he said yes, but uh, is there anyone from staff that might be able to speak to what he was referencing, or was it basically what we're talking about? Was this the options, the two options? So, Stephen, I just want to say thank you for being here, and uh, uh, I'd love to chat with you more and set up some one-on-ones and, and, and see what we can do to, to find the right approach. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is that the uh, only public participant on online? All right. Thank you. With that, do we have any further discussion or questions on this agenda item? I'm not seeing any this time. So um, at this point, I think it would be a good time for a break. Well, Councilman McCarthy agrees. Um, <laughs> Let's be back at five, it's 5.04 now, let's start back at 5.20. Yep. Jump in. All right, we are.